Yes? Yeah, I think that is a good idea. See you later. See you later, but that. Thank you. 
So uh, I want to welcome us to the Sabbath of the day, uh, that is uh, that eight, as we share the message that uh, God has for us today. So most importantly, uh, the first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to offer prayer, then we get into the lesson discussion as uh, the rest of us will join us in a, in a while. So let's let's pray. We thank you, good God, for the blessed Sabbath you've given unto us, Lord. We are children, and our life is prone to sin, and we've always done things that don't bring glory unto you. Our life has been very filthy. That's why we want to seek your face this Sabbath day and this moment, oh God. And we are requesting that God, you may transform our minds, because there are limited opportunities that we need to 
get to grasp so that Lord will bring more people in your vineyard, oh God. But I want to pray this particular hour, God, that you may transform our minds and renew us so that, Lord, we can have a different reflection in our lives on this Sabbath day and in our life in totality. We pray that let divinity reign even as humanity diminish each and every time, oh God. For the glory of your name, in the mighty name of Jesus, I do pray, trusting and believing. Amen. So I want us to get to something uh, here that um, we, we are going to share. We're going to get to learn about uh, just in a few in a few moments, in a few minutes. I want us to go to uh, to get to something here. That is Revelation 3, verse 21. Revelation 3, verse 21. Revelation 3 verse 21 has a some message that uh, that God is uh, God is is making clear to us that uh, and uh, like us to to get to learn what God really desires for us that is Revelation chapter 3 verses 21 So when you get there Revelation 3 verses 21 the Bible records let me just begin from verses 20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set, am set down with my father. So, uh, God or Jesus Christ, when, when Jesus Christ speaks that to him that overcome it, what do we overcome? We overcome the temptations of Satan. We overcome the, the snares of the devil and every other aspect that the devil bring or creep in, with into our life. And the most important thing is that our focus to be in Jesus Christ. And whenever our focus is in Jesus Christ, we'll always get a chance to, to connect ourselves, have a connection with Jesus Christ. And he says that, to him that overcometh, I will make him sit with my father. And we need to, to sit with the father, that is uh, our God, because Jesus Christ did it, and uh, we are not an exemption uh, to, to that. And we ought just to be in that number that are ready to share or are ready to, 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 are ready to be in the throne of God. And one thing we needed to note is that Jesus Christ is not going to come for those, somebody who is trying to be ready. No. Jesus Christ is going to come for those who are ready. It's a challenge upon us to ask that this morning or this Sabbath day, henceforth, let's be ready for the soon return of Jesus Christ. The things we don't know when, but we can tell the seasons. That's, that's the most important thing, that we can tell the seasons. We are in the, the end times, and the things unfold each and every day. Things, things tend to happen. And uh, we need to, to learn to live by that and also surrender our lives and uh, transform our view of things. Just like Christ say that he really wants those who will overcome to sit with his, to, to sit with the Father in his throne, the throne of God. And he said that he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say unto the churches. The Spirit of God was speaking to the churches and uh, the same Spirit is speaking to us today so that uh, we can have a, we can transform ourselves and uh, hear the message that is in Revelation 3. Actually, if you get some time, you can read the word of Revelation 3 and uh, tend, yeah. to, tend to understand what is there in Revelation chapter 3. You learn all that uh, God wants us uh, to have or God desires for the churches all the, the message to the seven churches that are, are there. So that is all I, want to, was, I wanted us to share before we get into so quickly into the lesson. And uh, let's pray. We thank you, good God, for the Sabbath. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for everything you're doing in our lives, oh God. That a mighty, a little reflection in our lives just shows how we are not getting ready for the soon return of the son and we are praying that lord you may revive us 
to transform our lives and make us get a different focus in matters pertaining to our spiritual well-being. In the mighty name of Jesus, I do pray. Amen. So, just uh, want to us to get to our lesson for today so quickly that uh, we don't waste a lot of time in that. So, our lesson for today, or the lesson for this this week that we discussed was the unlimited opportunities, the, um, the unlimited possibilities, sorry, the unlimited possibilities. When, you, when somebody talks about the unlimited possibilities, what, do, what, what, what comes to your mind? When somebody tells you unlimited possibilities, what comes to mind? I just want us to be to, to do it, to make it more interactive that unlimited possibilities. Just just share your thoughts on that so that we we get to know what is unlimited possibilities that uh, we are talking about here or here. The unlimited possibilities. Cliff, what do you think? Well, when you talk about uh, okay, uh, hi, uh, hi, unlimited possibilities. I I tend to think I not to think, but it means the 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 options which we can do, anything, the choices that we have, the 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 ability to make the choices possible. They are very unlimited. Yeah, they are so there are so plenty in number that we don't have. We are not limited by anything. We are not bound. We are free. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, I've, I've been speaking while my mic is muted. So I was saying that uh, the limited opportunities, the limited possibilities are the platforms that are there, the avenues that are there for all of us to, to share the word or uh, to ensure that our friends, the relatives that are, we have also knows about God, or also knows about uh, the, the spirit of God or the power that is there in uh, in uh, in ministering or in in serving God on Jesus Christ, because Revelation chapter three verses uh, verses twenty one really made it clear to us that to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. So whenever we overcome, God will grant us an opportunity to sit with Him on the throne. So it's upon us to ensure that we hear the message, because Christ even admonishes us that. He that hath an ear, that all of us having an ear, yes, you, we can have, we can have the ear, we can have that ear, we can hear well the message of God. But the most important thing is that a total reflection. That how does this message change our lives, or how does it transform us to be a be, to be better people, to be better Christians? That is the most important thing. That let the message transform us from within you know the the problem that probably we we have we have we are faced with is that we are informed but not transformed in the essence that we have the message 
we know about the three angels message we know about the prophecies we know about we know about what are yet to come we know about revelation we know about daniel but we are not transformed the transformation is the most important thing or the most uh, the, the, the most genuine aspect of a, a being a christian that there must be transformation you be transformed inwardly not the physical transformation that man can see you know we are like uh, we are like uh, we are in a pool that is let me say that the church we are around the pool but we don't want to get into the pool so that we remove our dirt that is there you see so that is the, that is the typical christian that we are nowadays faced with that we are in the pool in the church we are around the pool but not inside the pool inside the being inside the pool is that you're going to meet you're going to meet jesus christ in the pool so we need to to have that uh, avenue of transforming ourselves into better people so let's so, so quickly let's get to our lesson for today that is unlimited possibilities will go quickly if you have something to add i'll always uh, recommend that you you share your thoughts that is a uh, revelation uh, sorry our memory verse memory verse is from the book of first corinthians first corinthians chapter 12 verses 11 first corinthians chapter 12 verses 11 first corinthians 12 11 first corinthians 12 11 uh, it records this that uh, but all this worketh that one uh, but all these worketh that one and this and the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will that but one and the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills that is the holy spirit that distributes the gifts or they distribute the we are going to get to learn how the holy spirit distributes the gifts to each and every person not everybody we can't have the same gifts in, in ministry in the christian work we can't have the same gifts not all of us can be not all of us can be they can be prophets not all of us are, not all of us are uh, let me say not all of us are preachers they, but there is a role we can play in the christian work there's a role that definitely we have to play in the in the work of christianity or in the work of christianity uh so then up to up to there but what, what god calls us to witness for him we don't witness to any other person we don't witness about any other. So the most important thing we should also grasp the concept from last sabbath whereby we learned that the words we should speak are the inspired words of god not our own words they are the inspired words of god they are not our words if you are speaking your words when ministering, then definitely we are not doing the right thing. They should be the inspired words of God, because God is the one that shares the message. Or the, for there to be, I mean, for the work of the Holy Spirit, for the work of God to be accomplished, there must be the Holy Spirit. You remember the story of Paul uh, and the disciples. The Holy Spirit was guiding them that they were to go to this place and go to this place. So that is all we need to know. So that witnessing is not a special thing or a special spiritual gift. We can't say that somebody has a gift of witnessing. That you can witness to other people. You can preach to other people. You, can, uh, you, are, you are the only person who is entitled to, to witness. Everybody is entitled to witness. Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20 brings us the whole aspect of witnessing. That it is entitled to everybody. Not even a single person can say that he has the monopoly of ministering to others so the bible uses different expressions to 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 also let me, make us learn this to make it to describe it to describe our call before god there are different expressions that we the bible uses about uh, our call this the the call that uh, god has made unto us all of us and we need to we need to listen to to the voice that speaks the voice of Jesus Christ, the voice of the Holy Spirit. That is, we are being referred to as the light of the world. And that is number one from Matthew 5. Matthew 5 refers to us as the light of the world. Whenever we walk, whenever we, we call you are an Adventist, you need to be the light of the world. You need to preach and walk the talk. And whenever we walk the talk, then the glory of God is in us. This is that Holy Spirit in us. And God will always be happy whenever we, whenever His name in, is proclaimed in in, a, in our ministry, in our in our preaching. 
So God must in the sense that we are representatives of Christ. We are representing Christ and uh, we ought to live by that. Not even at a single point should we deviate from that. We are representing Christ. And Christ is uh, the center of everything. Then we are a royal priesthood. First uh, Peter, first Peter chapter um, chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2 verses, uh, verses 3. We are representatives of Christ. Jesus not only commissioned us to preach the gospel uh, throughout the world, but he also gave us gifts which, has, which help us uh, empower us to fulfill that mission. Spiritual gifts are di divinely bestowed qualities given by the Holy Spirit specifically to build the body of Christ and enable believers to be effective in the witnessing. That the spiritual gifts, they are being given to, to us. They are being given to us by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, but, And we are being told that specifically or specifically to build the body of Christ. The body of Christ must be built in us. The Holy Spirit wants the body of Christ to be built in us and enable believers to be effective witnesses in the world. We need to, when we want to be effective witnesses in the, in the world, then there's that the Holy Spirit, that uh, the, the whole aspect of our, uh, getting the getting the getting the, the power of the holy spirit manifested in us and uh, that is it there, there are limited opportunities even within our church there, there are there are opportunities from in within the, in our families itself there are opportunities so we want to we want to confine our minds into these and grasp all the concept and bring them together then we share we'll come to the conclusion that what god wants as to, to do cons, uh, in the matters pertaining to unlimited opportunities. Uh, then we are being told, who receives them? Who receives these? We are going to learn or we're going to know who receives these spiritual gifts that are divinely bestowed. They are not just uh, uh, gifts given, uh, given to anybody, but they are divinely bestowed. If there's somebody in this world who wants to tell you that I've given you the spirit of, um, of prophesying or of doing something, then no, we're lying. Because it is God himself who says that these gifts are divinely bestowed qualities, they're divinely bestowed, and who gives them? Definitely that is God who gives the, the, the spiritual gifts. And what is their purpose? We need also to learn that. That how can I know my gifts? We are going to learn how we know our gifts, and how can my gifts grow? How will our gifts grow to be a better to, to, to make us better Christians. So we've learned something that we are going to learn things here that who receives the who receives the gift, who gives, what is their purpose, how can I know my gifts, and how can my gifts grow? How will I know my gifts that are there? How will I know them? And uh, after that, we'll be able to know the will of God. Then we are also going to ask ourselves who receives them. Who receives these gifts? That is the number one thing that we are going to learn. Uh, that uh, dif differing gifts, we have differing gifts, but the same in the same service. We have differing gifts, but in the same service. You realize that in the church today, there are those who can preach well, there are those who can sing well, there are those there are those who can do different things. They can play different roles, but all in all, they come together. The same the center of it all is Jesus Christ. That all this we do for the glory of God. And uh, Paul compares the church, or the members of the church, to those of a human body. That is, uh, in, the, in, the, in this comparison, the church is the body of Christ. First, uh, first uh, Corinthians chapter 12, verses 20. First Corinthians chapter 12, verses 20. First Corinthians 12, verses 20. I'll request uh, Felix, if you have your Bible there, kindly read with us. First Corinthians 12, verses 12, verses uh, 20, sorry. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 20. Just unmute yourself, then you read it with us. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 20. Yes. Read with us 1 Corinthians 12, verses 20. 1 uh, Corinthians uh, 12 verses 20. 12 verse 20 reads, As it is, 
there are many parts, but one body. Yes, we are being told that as it is, First uh, Corinthians verse chapter twelve verse twenty. That, but now are they many members yet, but one body? Paul compares the members of the church to those of a human body. In this comparison, the church is the body of, of Christ. We always know that the church is Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And when is when Jesus Christ is the head of church. Paul compares the members of the church to those of a human body. The, we have the members of the church, different, uh, the, 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 the human body, sorry. We have different parts. We have head, we have eyes, we have nose, we have ears, we have mouth, we have legs and hands, the, the very div, the different parts that are there. And Paul compares the members of the church to those of a human body. And in this comparison, the church is the body of Jesus Christ himself. That the church is the body of Jesus Christ himself, who is uh, who should always be the center of everything that uh, we do in our lives. So, um, uh, Pitondari will prepare to take us uh, through the, the Tuesday and Wednesday part. So prepare to walk with us through the Tuesday and Wednesday part. So, we have the hands, like uh, in a typical body of a human being, we have hands, the eyes, the lungs, and uh, these, these parts are quite different. But each member has a unique characteristic and a function that it plays. The hands will always do the thing, the, the grasping, the eyes will always see, and also the lungs will also aid us in the, the breathing or so. So we need, to, we need to understand this, that each member has a it has unique characteristic and function, but the center of it all is that they age in one person for this person to be a living being. Whenever the lungs stop, then it means the breath of life has gone away from that person. And there's no, at no particular point, will you say that you want one part of your body? Maybe you are, you are saying that you want, you want your, your your hands all your hands to be to be move, removed and then the, this one does not mean that I'm, I'm trying to belittle those who are maybe physically handicapped no what i'm trying to say is that whenever there's that part of the body that has been removed then even the work is being it's our uh, playing some roles becomes very hard you need now to improvise you realize that there are those who don't have hands so they write to using their legs and it it seems very hard uh, and this is how we need to also understand that when Paul compares the church to those of a human body, he knows that in that church there are people with different gifts, people with different people of different categories. There are those who, who does who can do this, those who can do this, and he wants these people to bring or to come to one thing that they serve God, or they do everything for the glory of God. Likewise, each member is unique and has a unique set of gifts, even in us. We have the unique sets of gifts. We can't have the same gifts, all of us, that maybe in a church, all of us are preachers. All of us. All of us are prophets. Everybody has a unique gift. And how to unlock that gift is what you're also going to learn today. How to unlock, to unlock that gift that God has given unto us. And uh, we have a unique set of gifts. All the members of the body have a purpose. All the members of the body have a purpose, and there are no church members without gifts. There are no church members without gifts. So maybe probably you've been wondering, for me, surely, what, which gift has God given me? Uh, I don't know how to sing. I, I've never preached. So we are being told that each member has a gift. All the members of the body have a purpose, and there are no church members that without gift. So from today, if we don't, if we've not, not if we've not realized the gift that God has given unto us, then we re, we need to pray so that God to open our eyes and see the gift that He has given unto us. And all have received at least one spiritual gift, and we must work together to use those gifts. All of us have received. Maybe you have one or two. So, but use that to share the love and the truth of Christ with the whole world, not only. Uh, people you people that are not only are, you, you know the problem we have is that we always restrict ourselves to particular places we ought to share the message widely and that would be for the glory of god there are no dispensable or useless members 
those preaching to crowds are as valuable as those praying silently. They are nobody. They are no dispensable or useless, useless people in the church. They are not at all. Even that person who is not eloquent, even that person who can't speak, uh, who can't speak uh, out and people hear what he or she says, that person is not useless. They are, are as valuable as that person who preaches or as that person who always sings. They are still valuable. They have a role to play. So that is how we receive or who receives the gift. Or we have different uh, different gifts and uh, we are being told that everybody receives it. That is one thing I want us to learn. Everybody, everybody receives this gift. Nobody has been bad from receiving this gift. Everybody receives this gift and we ought to uh, to be happy in that. So I want to welcome Tondari to, or unless somebody has an addition or a question in that relation. Before we get to the Tuesday so quickly. Uh, it seems nobody. So we we are not, we are going to get to the Monday part. Sorry, not Tuesday. So Pitondari, you're welcome. Yes, thank you, Elder, for this opportunity. I will be taking you through Monday and Monday and Tuesday. All Monday up to which Monday up to Wednesday. All right, thank you. So Monday is talking about God, the giver of all gifts. And uh, the key texts are from uh, Mark 13, verse 34, which talks about a parable, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, and um, Ephesians 4, verse 7 and 8, which uh, <clears throat> talk about Christ being the originator of all good things or all gifts that we have in our possession. And um, in these verses, we get to realize that God uh, gave us promises of giving us some gifts and he already gave most of us or all of us those gifts. And um, in Mark, chapter 13, verse 34, we see a master who is leaving his servants behind and tells them to take care of his house. <clears throat> and so the responsibilities that he gives them are uh, to make sure that they always keep everything in line that he has left behind. And so God has also given us special gifts in our lives that are supposed to guide us in doing his will. And when you read further in that parable, when the master came back, when Yalipata, they have not done what was expected of them, they had to receive punishment. And so God has given us special gifts and has left them behind for us. He is the originator of all these gifts. Um, I would like that we read the uh, first Corinthians, those verses. Uh, let me get my Bible so that we read um, the book of first Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, the Bible says, but all these things work at that one of, um, that one of the self same spirit uh, dividing to every man severally as he will. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit dividing to every man uh, severally as he will. The other verse was uh, Ephesians 4 verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7, the Bible uh, says, Mm, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Uh, verse 8 also, the Bible says, Wherefore he saith, when he descended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. 
Then lastly, James chapter 1, verse 17. James chapter 1, verse 17, the Bible says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So all these good gifts that we have, all the good gifts that we have in our possession um, are from God in heaven. And he has given us not to sit on them, but to use them for his purpose. So it is very important that we show our, um, our possession of these gifts and we use them in the ministry of the work that God has given us. In 1903, Ellen White wrote a letter to someone and um, she encouraged this man to use the gifts to serve God. And uh, here is a quote, of, a quote of part of what he said. Uh, we are all members of God's family, all in a greater or less degree entrusted with God-given talent for the use of which we are held responsible. Whether our talents are great or small, we are to use them in God's service and we are to recognize the, and we are to recognize the right of everyone, the right of everyone else to use the gifts entrusted to them. So Christ has uh, given all of us gifts and as Elder Shem has um, expounded to us on the Sunday part and the previous days, that we all have different gifts. And it does not matter how small or how great your gift is, but all these gifts are important to the work of God. And we should all endeavor to discover these gifts and use them purposely to to, 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 to continue with the work of God. Then um, on Tuesday part, the purpose of spiritual gifts. The purpose of spiritual gifts. So spiritual gifts that all members of the church possess and have the responsibility of trying their best to recognize that they have these gifts and you, you should always endeavor to know, as we will see in uh, Wednesday part, you should always try your best to discover the gifts that, we, that, that, that you have so that you can realize their full potential and their purpose in the church. Because God has not given you a gift just because he didn't have someone else to give or just because um, he had an excess of those gifts so akamua tu akupea ila anakupa kwa sababu anataka uzitumie kwa ajili ya kufanya kazi yake so the purpose of spiritual gifts is primarily to make sure that the work of god progresses in a much better way mm, it's like when you are um, you, you want to cut down a tree when you want to cut down a tree, you can use an axe. But you see this axe, if it, is a, if it is a blunt axe, it will not help you to accomplish the work in a, in a more effective way. But if someone gives you a, a file, <clears throat> and so you use that file to sharpen that axe, then that file becomes a gift to you that is helping you to accomplish the work that you are doing in a much more efficient and uh, faster way. So God has given us several gifts that have very many uses in uh, the ministry of his work. And we are to use these gifts to draw others closer and closer to him. For example, there are uh, gifts of uh, leadership. <clears throat> there are gifts of uh, prophecy. There are gifts of teaching. So if, for example, your gift is leadership, you should try your best to make sure that you lead people in the right direction. If you are an influential person, you should use that gift 
to make sure that you bring change in the lives of people so that they uh, also get to discover their talents. You see, as, as the Tuesday part ends, the writer of the lesson says that those who have gifts, especially leaders, have their primary purpose as making others to also realize their gifts and nurture those <coughs> uh, gifts. So they are, um, yeah, the, the, the lesson also talks about something else called talents. And I want to make it clear what talents and gifts are to us. And um, it says the gifts that we have <coughs> are divinely given to us um, purposely for the work of ministering to others. And we may have several talents. People may have talents that can also be used for the purpose of ministry. But mm, not all these talents can be used uh, for, for, for the work of ministry. For example, if your talent is, is uh, playing in a certain game, you see, it may not be directly linked to ministering to others. But if you have a talent, for example, of, um, of, 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 of easily being able to, to, to do some work, for example, charity work, you can easily do that and you draw people to Christ. So some talents can be used for ministry while others cannot be used for ministry, but all gifts must be used for ministry because that is the purpose that God has um, created them for. Um, the special gifts of the spirit are not the only talents uh, presented um, in the parable that is, uh, that is the, in that parable of uh, the talents that God gave to people. That, that that master gave to his people. Remember that parable where someone was given 10 talents, another one five and another one one. But one of them decided to play safe. A feature talent yake ili asidi akaipoteza. Like in trying to use the talent that person was thinking, there is a possibility that I could lose this thing. So let me keep it very safe. And then when the master comes back, I will give it back to him. Then this person also had um, a, a very bad idea of what the master was trying to do. The master was giving them a chance to better themselves. But this person was thinking, this master wants to reap where he did not sow. He wants to give me one talent and wants me to generate more so that I give back to him. So this person said, I won't let this person take advantage of me. But the other two made use of what God, of what the master had given them. And by so doing, the master came and rewarded them. So the lesson says that by using the gifts that we have, we make them better. But when we don't use them, we lose them. When we have an opportunity to do something, we become better in doing that thing if we take that opportunity. But if we don't make use of that opportunity, we will lose even the power to do what we had a chance to do. So the gifts that we have, we should use them purposely for the work of ministering to others and not just to sit on them so that um, in, in the idea of trying to preserve them. Um, then the Wednesday part, uh, God promises his church all the gifts of the Holy Spirit just before his return. But you see, we, in as much as we all have these gifts that God promised us, there is only one way that we can discover these gifts. Remember the disciples, when Christ was actually choosing his disciples from uh, wherever they were, alikuwa anajua um, their abilities. For example, when he was recruiting Matthew, he knew 
this is someone who is accurate and he is very neat. He knows how to organize his things. He is good in calculations and he knows how to organize vitu zake vizuri. Alipokuwa anamuita Petero, alikuwa anajua huyo ni mtu ambaye anaweza akawa kiongozi mzuri. But Peter didn't know that at that time. So when Christ was recruiting these people before they devoted themselves to much prayer in Jerusalem, that is where Christ had told them to wait. Christ went to heaven and told them to wait in Jerusalem until he sends them a helper. And as they were waiting, they were earnestly praying. And during that prayer is when the Holy Spirit descended upon them and they got to discover their gifts. Paul, no, no, sorry, not Paul. Peter and the other disciples got to know that indeed they were even much more fit for the ministry work than they thought initially. So before you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, God has given us these gifts, but it is only the Holy Spirit that has the key to unlocking our minds to identify the gifts that um, God has given us because the gifts are already ours in Christ. But their possession depends upon the reception of the Spirit of God. That is in Christ's object lessons, page uh, 347. So these gifts, in as much as we possess them, we can never recognize that we have them unless we earnestly pray to God and ask him to reveal to us these gifts through the power of uh, the Holy Spirit. What are your specific gifts? And more importantly, how can you improve those gifts for the Lord's service? This is a question to those who have realized what their special gifts are. What are these gifts? And how are you using them? Or how can you use them to better improve those gifts for the Lord's service? You see, uh, when you continually use your gifts, you grow them. And as you do that, you become better in doing that. So what are some of the ways that you can distinctly use your gift? For example, it is interpreting prophecies. How can you use that gift? For example, it is teaching. How can you use that gift and improve it so that it can serve others better and also improve you? So as I finish the Wednesday part, when we are given these gifts, when God gives us these gifts, or when the Holy Spirit reveals to us the gifts that we have, they don't come in a fully grown version. Zinakuja kama watoto. Unapo mtu anapo za mtoto, anamlea, mpaka uyu mtoto anaweza kujitegemea mwenyewe anakuwa mkubwa. Kwa hivyo hivi vipawa ambavyo roho mtakatibu anafungua ana, ana macho yetu ili tuweze kuviona vinakuja vikiwa vichanga. Kwa hivyo ni jukumu letu sisi kama wa Kristo ambao tumefunuliwa majukumu haya ambayo tunayo we grow these gifts and responsibilities that God has given us until they develop to levels that are effectively serving God. If you are able to interpret things, you need to practice that more and more. You see, when um, the, the, the coordinator of the Thursday part is going to talk more about this, but I'll just finish there by saying that these gifts don't come in a fully developed version. Instead, they come as young gifts and it's up to us to develop uh, these gifts. Is there someone with um, an addition on those three days before we usher in Thursday part? Sorry, Felix, your network.
maybe il, il, uh, as, he, as the network is still uh, having a problem i can also say this uh, that uh, we have different gifts and all of us uh, just like we were dif- wanted to differentiate between the gifts and the talents so that uh, we can we get these things right is that um, we need to learn that uh, there are more gifts in addition to those the the ones talked about in uh, the, the ones the, the gifts of the holy spirit that you always know there are ones in addition to those like you realize that somebody's a somebody's a he's a pilot you see somebody maybe somebody knows how to do some photo editing some maybe i, I think we know the, all these things but you're being told that yes this god does not say that now we should should this uh, uh, we should dispose all this uh, all these gifts that uh, all these uh, other uh, maybe let me call them talents that we have or, or other areas of specialization we find ourselves in but the most important thing is that those places we find ourselves in let the glory of god be seen or be known that yes you are a, you are a pilot you are a, you know to edit photos you 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 are a, you are a, you can do something good you can manage maybe different aspects of of uh, maybe to things to do with technology but you're being told that their purpose is to empower every believer to fulfill their function even if you are a pilot yes it it is it, there's, there's no way in the bible says that that is saying that the gifts of the holy spirit being a pilot no but let the glory of god be seen in that if you are a, if you are a, maybe even if you are a high school teacher be, they let the glory of god be seen the, more, the the bottom line is god to be seen so spiritual gifts are not natural talents they are not natural talents we can't say that um prophecy this is a natural talent maybe I just I just acquired it acquired it you know these are things that always come from the holy spirit himself so we need also to get that the holy spirit can sanctify natural talents when god is there in our natural talents yes you can do some artwork a very good artwork the the holy spirit can sanctify that for the glory of god and put them in service of christ so every talent we find ourselves in or everything we do that the holy spirit be our guide and i just think you we should maybe we, we should also know the meaning the gifts of the holy spirit the gifts of the holy spirit we talk about um uh, talk about prophets uh, the some of evangelists some are pastors we talk pastors teachers uh, some can do healing the mira performing miracles some are even apostles something like that so we have different there are different gifts of the holy spirit but i want us to also remember that god can sanctify our natural talents our natural talent so that me, maybe this is where some of us do get it wrong that if we don't if we are not pastors if we are not evangelists if we are not prophets if we are not teachers or he we cannot heal then we are doomed no god can sanctify the the the, 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 the natural talent that we have thank you yes amen thanks a lot elder uh, is there any other addition Felix you had an addition Okay so if there is uh, no other addition I will uh, welcome Elder Shem to take us through the last day of the study Thank you very much thank you very much uh how can we know about how can i know my gifts or how, how how do i tend to know that now for me i'm talented in maybe speaking in uh, in, in preaching or uh, something like that so that this is what I, we want to to get uh, have a, just a summary of it so quickly so that we can also get into the other programs so we just uh, let me just open a verse here so that we can read uh, yes we need to growing our gifts the, the the parable of the the talents you remember the parable of the talents that uh 
that we, we we talked about the parable of the talents where those people are given given different sums of money and uh how they utilized it at the end of it all for everyone to for to everyone who was who was more will be given and he will have abundance but from him who does not have even what he has will he has will be taken away that is uh, matthew 25 verses 29 that even to him that has but to from him who does not have even what he has will be taken away uh, a verse that is most of the time is more people tend to misinterpret it that uh, for, to everyone who has more will be given when we become faithful in what god has given us then more will be added unto us just like the 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 the, 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 the first servant the first two servants they were very uh, faithful in what they had been given and we realized that they were added more so whenever we are faithful, we'll be added more. But if, if God has given us something and we don't use it, you've been given a talent of maybe let, let, let's say that you can preach well, but you don't want to use it, utilize that time, it will be taken away from you so that you'll be empty because th that, that's probably what we desire or what we want. If we don't want to utilize what God has given unto us. The Jesus explained this parable well, that everyone receives gifts, but some people receive more than others that everyone receives gifts, but some other people will receive more than others because some of us have decided to bury the gift that God has given unto us. We've buried it. We are saying that, let me just bury it. I'll wait for Jesus Christ to come. I'll wait for him when he'll come. I'll just give him that. You gave me the gift of, uh, of preaching, but the, the environment around me was very hostile. I could not even preach. So we should, we should learn from that. However, that's, that, that's the starting point only. We can negotiate with our initial gifts. We can negotiate with our initial gifts. So, yes, we are, we we are, you have some other other than uh, other than you be we had we talked about the natural the natural the natural talents. That somebody is just born. Somebody is born with with. So when you are born with something, we've said that let this one also the glory of God be seen in whatever you you are born in, with that they will grow as we use them. The gifts grow as we use them, and we may also receive new gifts. Be careful that as we grow, as we grow, we, as we use them, we may receive new gifts. As you become a preacher, you can receive new gifts in the course. You become a, you go, God now reveals to you the greater things when you be faithful in that. Be careful as we may lose our gifts if you don't use them. Just like the the. The, the, the third servant who lost the, the gifts that he had been given, the talent that he had been given. So ask God to show you how, which gifts he has given you and how you can best use them. It doesn't matter how many gifts you have received, but what you do with them, that is it. The, the now, the, now the back falls with us. That now, how, how are we using the gifts that God has given? us the gift that god has man has put into uh, into place in our spiritual life so that is uh, all that is very important so just lastly to read on this uh this one just a comment from uh, christ object lesson uh, chapter uh, 25 sister white records to his servants christ commits his goods something to be put to use for him he gives to every man his work each has its place in the eternal plan of heaven. Each is to work in cooperation with Christ for the salvation of souls. Not more surely is the place prepared for us in the heavenly mansions than is the special place designated on earth where we are to work for God. That there is no more, uh, no more sure, uh, no more, that not more is sure, surely is the place prepared for us in the heavenly mansion than is the special place designated on earth where we are to work for God. So if we can't change now, if we, uh, by the way, if we cannot change now, if we cannot transform ourselves now and be better Christians, then we say that when we will transform ourselves when Jesus Christ will come, then I think we are lying to ourselves. We need to transform ourselves as early as now because there's no change we're going to make after death. There is no change totally. So that is it. And we've learned how to grow our talents. Then the only way to grow your talents is that ask God to be there to go to walk you through.
Otherwise, I'll also give room to an addition uh, before we come to the closure. Anybody who has something to add, maybe a question? Yes, I would love to give a very brief addition on the lesson generally, that uh, in, in the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 48, Christ tells his disciples that to whom much is given, much is going to be expected. And uh, one, 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 one film director uh, changes that, Ama paraphrases that and says <clears throat> that uh, with great power comes great responsibility. That when more power has been given to you, then you must by all means use that power for the good of um, others. If you don't use that power, something disastrous will happen, not only to you, but to others, because when that power comes, then bad things would possibly also increase. Then um, the last verse I'd love to add, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 21, which says, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known, known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. I would explain that in a way of somehow changing the words a little, that for it would have been better for them not to have had those gifts than for them to have the gifts and to fail to use them. It would be much better if your only gift is being faithful to God in, for example, helping someone who is in trouble, than when God gives you, gives you the gift of maybe prophecy and you fail to use that gift because God will hold you responsible for that and he will have a lot of questions for you on the judgment day of why you did not use that gift. So let us all try as much as we can to discover and use our gifts maximally. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like request if there's no further additional request, uh, Peter, to I'll request uh, Cliff, <laughs> Cliff Mokua, please pray with us as we close the discussion. Okay, uh, we, we pray. Our mighty and everlasting Redeemer, again, this time we congregate in this platform to give honor to your name. We pray, the Lord, that whatever activities are remaining, whatever plans are, that are in store for us, we pray you may guide us all through. Help us in, in our discussion. Help us on glorifying your name more. Uh, help us in all our endeavors, and we, we will praise your name always. I ask this short prayer, trust and believe in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very much, and uh, may God bless us all. So I'd like us uh, to get a reading, our key text. Uh, that is um, Genesis, Genesis 19, Genesis chapter 19. Then I'll welcome our speaker. I'll read Genesis 19, verses 16. We are reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 19, the verses 16, which records that... Uh, I think, let me confirm if I have the correct verse. Yes. And when and while he lingered, the man laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him with uh, and set him without the city. So that is uh, what we are going to share today, and I'll, let me pray. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of all life as your man servant is going to share with us the last night of Sodom, O oh God. And typically the world we are in, Lord, is like Sodom, or even far much worse than Sodom, O oh God. 
because we've done and we indulge into a lot of things that don't bring glory unto you. And the call is unto us that we have the last night. And Lord, we pray that you may, we may receive this word and it transform us and make us be better Christians and we may come closer and closer to the throne of God. Because one thing we are assured of is that when our son Jesus Christ is going to leave the most holy place, then all our faith is going to be sealed. We are not going to have any room to do the repentance of God. We pray that you may make us do the work that Christ left for us when it is still day, because a night is coming when no man shall work, O God. Also pray that, Lord, you may make us have a different focus and change our lives for the betterment of your word and uh, always to glorify your name. In the mighty name of Jesus, I do pray, trusting and believing. Amen. So I want to welcome our speaker. Uh, I want to welcome our speaker, Brother Dan Kitur, to also share with us the message that he has. So, Brother, please feel most welcome. Thank you very much for welcoming me. And um, trust that you have been well. And uh, God has kept you. And... Um, just want to, I don't plan on taking a lot of time, um, but I hope I'm, I'm audible enough. Um, yes, yes, you're audible. Wonderful. All right. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's indeed a, a good day and, uh, Shall we pray so that we can uh, proceed? Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you once again. You have been indeed good to us. Father, as, as we get into your word, I pray that your spirit will guide us. I pray that you will open up the eyes of our understanding that our hearts will be enlightened to, to catch a glimpse of what your will is in our lives. May your spirit guide us, forgive us, cleanse us, heal us, grant us to be accepted in Christ Jesus before you. It's our sincere prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the last night of Sodom. That's the that's the that's the that's the title of of, of what we are going to share together. Now on on November 18th, 2018, about 6:25 a.m. Um, seven and a half miles from a town in California called Paradise, a fire had started beneath a high voltage electric tower. Not long before that, not long after that, uh, reports started coming in. A firefighter is reported to have said this has potential for a major incident. And by 7.30, the fire, the fire had picked up and the wind was spraying burning embers in every direction. And a column of smoke was now visible for miles. Uh, circumstances were strange this day because um, you know, they say firefighters usually get um, real-time information on how the fire is progressing uh, because of the personnel who are battling it and also the aircraft, the aircraft machinery which they use to fight the fire and combat it. But it was windy that day. 
And so no one knew how fast the fire was moving. And it was suddenly moving towards the town of paradise. And um, the town of paradise was about four, let's say about seven, um, eight, nine kilometers away from where it had begun. And um, there was a canyon separating um, the, the town and uh, the fire. And in past times, fires had rarely crossed the canyon. But that morning, the fire which now was called, or which was named Campfire, was now spreading at the rate of 80 football fields a minute. The 911 dispatcher that morning was a lady called Carol Ladrini. Now, Ladrini contact, contacted California Fire and they told her that the fire was miles from paradise. And she reasoned generally a fire that far away would never even get close to paradise. So I continued to tell people that were calling in, reporting the fire that they were not under threat. By 7.45, the fire had crossed the canyon and was threatening paradise and the surrounding area, which was home to about 40,000 people. So California Fire issued out an evacuation order. But not for all those who are from other parts of the town. A male caller calls in and says, it's raining ash where I live. How far out is the fire? Ladrini, the dispatcher says, at this point, you're not in danger, but just stay close to your phone. 18 minutes after the fire entered the town, Ladrini received a call from California Fire. And the message was straightforward. We have just issued mandatory evacuations for the entire town of, the, of Paradise, to which she responded, are you serious? Later on, Carol would uh, say, it breaks my heart that they got a false sense of security. It breaks my, my heart that I and anybody else that was answering the phone that day was not able to give them more information, better information and faster information. There was a Sergeant Robert Pickering who was on duty that day while in the thick of it reports, I can hear the roaring. I could see the flames coming up from the canyon and there were probably about 10, 20, 30 meters high. And it went black really quick. It felt like we were working the night shifts. Mind you, this was about 8 a.m. in the morning. And so the fire was swirling around the houses. It was coming in at all angles, he says, defying any sense of gravity or any sense um, of, in my mind, what would be a normal fire or what would be normal for a fire. Corey Honia, one of the fire chiefs in California, says, Cell phone towers went down. The networks were so clogged that we couldn't get through. It was an event that literally outpaced all our resources almost immediately. Literally outpaced all of the planning that had been done prior to this. And ultimately, he says, people have to be responsible for their own safety. The best person to craft an evacuation plan for you is you. 
there was a nurse who was working on uh, in a hospital in paradise that day she describes the evacuation this way she says it wasn't a normal evacuation that we had been planning and rehearsing mind you they say that in the state of california no other county had so much elaborate plans matching up to those that paradise had but she says this day it was not a normal evacuation we had not been planning this and we had not been rehearsing this it was so fast robert continues on to say that too much was happening too much was going on and we were not able to do more than just a couple of handful of streets as we were evacuating Nicole, who's the nurse, continues on to say that we were stuck in traffic for quite a while. There was a young lady by the name Jordan Huff describing how they were in the traffic. She says it was suffering. You know, we were moving. It was suffering moving that slow. We were all about to burn alive. And why isn't everyone full speed ahead? Why are we stuck? Why are we stuck? Why? How? She wondered. There was a female driver unnamed who approaches uh, Robert and uh, she asks, how far out is the fire? And Robert responds, it's, it's right here. It's everywhere. We are 100% surrounded by fire. In less than an hour, the fire had swept across the town of Paradise. Um, a gentleman responsible for planning in the state of California says this fire was unique. Other fires usually followed a particular path, one path, designated path. So they were able to fight, you know, fire in, 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 you know, in one front. But this one was unique. It had paths. It had a lot of paths and these paths were happening, all of them at the same time. Although the entire town was under an evacuation order, thousands of residents were still at home. A young lady by the name Christina Taft was living with her mother. She says this, I wasn't thinking that it was that serious at first. And then in the, in the shower, I started to smell smoke. I was definitely panicked. I thought it, would, it could all burn. And I, told, and I told that to my mom. And she just, she just didn't want to listen to the negativity. She was just not really panicking. I was just packing. And she didn't even get out of her pajamas. And then she started calling other people to find out what was happening. Looking outside, it started getting darker and with lots of traffic. I just didn't know what to do. It was either I leave or I stay and risk my own life. And I had a life to leave, she says. I told her that, that is my mama. I have a life to leave. And she was just talking to other people on the phone and they weren't telling her, leave. Therefore, she remained. Carol describes this particular incident as she was navigating out of paradise. My car started to fill up with smoke. And at that point, I told my husband, my car is filling up with smoke. I have to get out of the car. And he was like, get out and run. And I responded, I can't get out and run. You don't understand, there is fire everywhere. I can't run through the fire. And he said, you're going to have to. NASA reported that the fire was visible from space. And it took only four hours for paradise to be destroyed. 
By the end of the day, 50,000 people had managed to escape, scattering to neighboring towns, and around 30,000 people had lost their homes. And it took many weeks to identify those who died. They say about 85 perished that morning. And paradise burned for over two weeks. One resident described that it was like a war zone. It was as if bombs had been dropped on the town. Finally, the winter rains came and put out the fire. By the end, it had burned 153,000 acres, an area about the size of Nairobi County. Just think about it. As I finish the illustration here, Jordan Half describes the moment that she was leaving paradise. And she says this, there was literally a point on the road where it went from hell to there was a sky again and there was air to breathe. And it was this type of feeling that changes your whole entire life. I just got this chance to be able to live again. Perhaps like lots thousands of years ago. We meet with him in Genesis chapter 19 verse 1. Two angels came into Sodom that evening. Previously in Genesis chapter 18, you get a description of the character of the righteous on the eve of impending judgment. Abraham pleading for a wicked city. Abraham pleading for life. A strange bargain with God. If there are 40 righteous, if there are 30 righteous, if there are 20 righteous. Of course, you notice that Abraham is far, far away from that wicked city. But we meet Lot in 19 verse 1 of Genesis. Two angels come in that evening, the first part of the verse says, now the sun has gone down in the western hills. The brief twilight lingers as if it doesn't want to go. And so perhaps we trace the footsteps of a young man, a young lady that evening. Enticed by the siren voice of pleasure. Hesitating at the threshold of the house of death. And then finally setting his feet on his way to the grave with a smile. They enjoy the season as it passes, taking no thought of the morrow, going to every excess in indulgence. The Bible continues on to say that Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. In Genesis chapter 13, we find a controversy between his servants and Abraham's servants. And to end that controversy, Abraham offers a solution. He says, behold, the whole land is before you. Choose which part you want. And the sad record of scripture is that Lot chose for himself the plains of Sodom. In other words, he excluded everything but his own desire in that particular simple choice. And it is on this basis that he arranged his priorities. In doing this, Jesus would later say, is the same, same attitude reflected in the world today. Men seeking the things of the kingdom before seeking the kingdom and his righteousness. And so the Bible says, Lord pitched his tent towards Sodom. Make no mistake, he was not in the city, he was not in the city yet, but he was near it. He was still living in tents, you know, the character of a sojourner, pilgrims, you know, moving from one place to another. 
and he pitches it outside of the city of Sodom in order to take advantage of all the cultural pursuits of the city. In chapter 14, we find him that he is now dwelling in Sodom. By the time of the invasion of the five kings, he had moved right into the city. And now in chapter 19, we find him as the mayor of the town. Now, they are not, now he is not only in Sodom. As we trace out the very details of his life in scripture, we find that Sodom was in him. When Lord saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth. Verse 2 would tell us, and he said, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. Strange visitors these are. But he pressed them strongly so that they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked and leavened bread and they ate. I wonder what would have happened that faithful night if Lord hadn't pressed him longer. These were God's me messengers of judgment. But Lord pressed them. He said, of course, I know it is free of you to spend your night in the square, but I beg you, I entreat you, I urge you, please come and tarry with me in my house. Verse 4 tells us, but before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, and notice the following words, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. You know, you notice the contrasts in chapter 18 and chapter 19 of the book of Genesis. Abraham is pleading for 50, for 40, for 30, for 20, for 10, but sad is the record in chapter 19. Everyone, all the people to the last man surrounded the house of Lot for to do strange things. Verse 19, chapter 19, verse 5 tells us, and they called to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Where are these men who came to you tonight? These men can go, cannot go to sleep unless they have done something evil. Proverbs chapter 4 from verse 14 to 16. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not go into it. Turn, your, turn, your, turn away from it and pass on for they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed off of sleep unless they have, they have made someone to stumble. There was continually a restless evil in the city of Sodom. Temptations and indulgences that would not allow men to sleep. And that is the sad record of the world today. Perhaps the sad history of someone's life. Things that would not allow them to sleep. Temptations that stalk them, disturb them, you know, keeping you awake in the night when the rest of the world has gone to bed. The enemy entertaining you with his merchandises. This particular man said, where are these men who came to you tonight? Bring them out that we may know them. And of course, the word know them there is not the knowing that we know that, hey, look, I see Brother Antipas Shem, or I see Brother Ondario, or Brother Getmo, or Brother Arnold. But, but, but it was a particular, it is, it is the, the original word there connotes, we want to have a sexual experience with them. That we may know them, they say. Verse 6 tells us, Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, 
I beg you, my brothers, sounds like he was very much at home in Sodom. Do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. A life in Sodom will make you do very strange things. I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. And so Lot's response is one that is mingled with good intentions and foolish thoughts. You know, Lot was prepared to violate one duty in order to maintain another. There was a tension between his intention and his motives and his actions. And this is what will happen when we tarry long in atmospheres soaked with evil. Evil has a way of seeping into our minds. When we listen to something more, more of, when we listen to something indulge in looking at it, experience it even by uh, acting on it even just one time, evil has a way of reorienting the mind. And of course, God speaks and communicates his truth to the mind, affecting it, turning the course of man. So also does evil. And so Lot is vexed, is vexed by the unrighteousness in Sodom. He is trying to appease wickedness here. And you cannot appease wickedness by supplying to it. He says, look, you man, you are so, you, you, want to, you want to indulge in your passions. I have two daughters of mine, untouched by any man. And so Lord thinks that the only way we can appease wickedness is by supplying to it. But that is not the case, my friends. It is only by starving it. Oh, you kill lust, you kill desires, desires, not by doing them, but by giving them nothing. I read in the testimonies that it is my duty, it is your duty to do the right and leave the consequences with God. And so you cannot bargain with evil. You cannot make a deal with a madman. You can picture these men clamoring with animal passions over these men and Lord thinks that he can bargain with them. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 29, do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute. Let the, lest the land fall into prostitution and the land become full of depravity. What Lord was just about to do was not in keeping with God's will. Verse 9, but they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn. Notice those words. This fellow came to sojourn. You know, we meet him in chapter 19, verse 1, as sort of the mayor in the city, the judge. Perhaps the only Seventh-day Adventist who has a good idea of what good must happen in this particular wicked city has been made judge. But now when the tables are stunned, when the citizens demand their blood, they call Lot a sojourner, a stranger. Who made you judge over us? And of course, my friends, they continue telling him, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal with you worse than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and they drew near to break the door. In other words, Lot, get along or get out of our way. You see, my young friends, any sort of alliance with sin is temporary. You cannot hope to make a permanent alliance with sin. Sin will make you carry its load and in death unload you looking for another pers person to carry that particular load. Sin will not partner with you for eternity. Sin knows that it is, but it has but one destination, the very fires of death. And that will be my end. 
And so there, there, there cannot be any permanent alliance that you and I can make with sin. Any advantages that it offers us, they are not permanent, only temporary. They are illusions. You know, in the desert, you may think because of the sweltering heat that you see water somewhere, you see an oasis somewhere, only for you to find out that no, 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 this is just air, hot air rising, evaporating, making you think that it is water and that is what sin does. You're only friends, but for a moment. Who made you judge over us? In other words, we know where you are from. You're not part of this city. We want you to get out of our way or we will deal with you. Psalms chapter 36 from verse 1 to verse 4 tells me, transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes that iniquity cannot be found out and hated. For, he, for the words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He assists to act wisely and do good. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that he is not good. He does not reject evil. And so we find this company of men. Actually, the words of scripture say, every man in that particular city, to the last man, from the eldest to the youngest, were round about home, Lot's home that particular day, blind, blind spiritually. Verse 10 tells me, but the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And so these strange visitors, of course, we shall learn that their angels later on grab Lot. And were it not for them, Lot would have been a dead man that particular night. And they struck the men with blindness, verse 11, who at the entrance of the house, both small and great so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. Lord has been speaking with these men, thinking to appease evil. But these men have been deaf to exhortation and rebu rebuke. And the Lord now decides, you know what? I'm going to give them up to their strong delusions. As the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 would tell us, that when men are eventually lost, when men believe a lie, it is because they do not love the truth. Therefore, God will give them up to strong delusions. God does not do this. But men place themselves in positions outside of the commonwealth of grace and mercy. And so in a bid to get their attention, he allows blindness to come upon them, physical blindness. But you see, this continues to tell us as they were groping at the door, that this physical blindness was just but a reflection of the spiritual one in their hearts. They could not see it. They continue groping for the door. You know, you are incapacitated to get it, but you continue pursuing after it. They continue clamoring after their passions and thereby that particular night seal their fate. Like the dog that returns to its own vomit, Peter says, strange are the men living today. Continue clamoring and when you can imagine when fire rained down the following morning, these men could not see it, for we have no evidence of their blindness departing from them. And so they could not see the fire. They could not make preparation for it. Therefore, could not escape it. And so the temptation of the cities of Sodom told these men, just do what you want. And that's what they did from verse 4 to verse 11. We don't have time. Verse 12 continues on to tell us. Then the man said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, 
sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of the place, for we are about to destroy this place. And of course, this particular strange conference in the night reveals who these particular men were. They were angels. And they say to Lot, this particular city, this particular people has been, their sin, their outcry has become great before God. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who are to marry his daughters? And I paused there. I thought about it. When the text said that every man in the city was around Lot's house, I couldn't help but wonder, were these particular sons-in-law also outside with that particular company? No weak, no backbone men. They were willing for things to happen to their future wives, things that are very bad. And so Lot went out to his sons-in-law and said, up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be just in. Very sad words. The coming day looks down from the eastern hills with a smile. But the angels have said the Lord will destroy this city. And that is reason enough for alarm. And that is reason enough for immediate flight. When he threatens it, when God says something, it is the part of fortitude to fear. When he commands it, it is the first dictate of duty and of safety to obey. Up, get you out from this particular place. But he seemed as one that mocked. They laughed at his superstitious fears. Their daughters influenced by their husbands. They were well enough where they were. They could not see any evidence of danger. Everything was just as it had been. They had great possessions. And they could not believe it possible that that beautiful city would be destroyed. And so the temptations of the city of Sodom tells the sons-in-law, don't worry about it. Verse 15, as morning dawned, the angels urged Lord saying, up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. You know, I had trouble reconciling Genesis chapter 18 and Genesis chapter 19. Abraham eventually says 10. And God says, I will not wipe away the righteous with the wicked. But here we find in chapter 19 verse 15. That it is only four people. And even if we investigate their life. We have trouble reconciling the word righteous in chapter 18 with the people who are now about to be rescued out of the city. You know, look at the actions of Lot this particular night. Look at the actions of the sons-in-law of Lot this particular night. And tell me whether really Abraham was pleading for righteous men. What was God doing this particular morning? My friends, he was just simply saving sinners. Verse 16 tells me, but Lot lingered. He lingered. The temptations of the cities of Sodom told Lot, Lot, just a while longer. All the seductions and falsehoods of temptations, my friends, all the dangers of sorrows and, and perdition are bound up in that particular one word, wait a little longer. The voice of love speaks to us. In terms of terror and alarm, God's patience will not always last. The day of grace must soon have an end. And with many, it is much shorter than they expect. But Lot lingered. The Bible continues on to say, so the man seized him and his wife 
and with his two daughters by the hand, and the Lord being merciful to him. Mercy is when God gives you something you don't deserve. Mercy is when God affords you opportunity that you never have worked for. Something that you could never hope to get, but now extended to you. In mercy, these particular angels literally drag out Lot, his wife, and their two daughters from the city. The text says they hastened him out of the city. And so sinners must be hastened out. Let us say to each other, escape for your life, the angel said to Lot. Better lose all than lose your soul. Don't look behind of the attainments of failure or attainments of success. Linger nowhere outside the city. Jesus says, haste ye. Because if you do not, indecision strengthens habits. When you don't meet with temptation decidedly, it must be repeated again. And so don't linger. Haste out, haste out, haste out. And the text said that they brought him and set him outside the city. You know, man will not be transported heavenward as just a passive passenger. There is a portion of the work left for man to do. He must steer the oars for himself. The text says that Lot and his family were brought out of the city. The remaining part of the journey they must undertake. Make no mistake. They will not undertake in their own strength. For mercy has demonstrated that the one who took you out of the middle of the city and placed you out of the city is able. It is no lack of power on his behalf. But he says, you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ, more than justifying men before God, this gospel of Jesus Christ imparts strength for him to obey. And so Lot was placed outside the city and now he must continue walking in the light that has shone on his path. The Bible says in verse 17, and as they brought them out, one said, escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere else in the valley. Escape to the hills lest you be swept away. And that is a strange yet real voice of love, even thundering in alarm, that you must escape. Friends, as we look at the world today, the conditions of society, as we look at even the very details of our lives, the text tells me, Now, these particular similar conditions will be repeated in our day and age. And men must learn to escape for their lives. When light shines, men must continue walking in, their, in its path. Some friend of mine tells me, when the, sun, when, when, when the sun rises up, it is not for you to look at it, but to walk in its light. It is no time for you to admire light, to admire truth and say, this is beautiful. But it is time for me to inculcate truth into the very fabric of Christianity. This particular righteousness imparted must be robbed into the very fabric of my life. In other words, the gospel is practical. It has results, practical results. The text says the wind blows where you do not know. But you can see the movement of branches telling you, hey, there's particular, there's wind here. And so the Holy Spirit abides in the heart as a regenerating agent. We cannot see him, but by faith, we can be able to catch him as dwelling in our hearts. Paul writes in the book of Ephesians and he says, for this cause I bow my knees before the Father. 
that he may grant that we may be strengthened in the inner man, that Christ would live in us by faith, that we may be able to comprehend the length, the depth, the height of God's love towards us. And this particular love works by faith. And so a lot must be left to demonstrate that he appreciates the efforts of divinity in saving him outside from out of the city. He and his wife and his daughters must trudge that straight and narrow out of the city. They must not look behind. They must not entertain uh, thoughts about the past. Therefore, Paul writes in the book of Philippians and says, this one thing I do, forgetting those things that, I be, that are behind me, I press towards the mark of my high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Onward, every step of the way, God supplying the strength. Every other ladder, that we must, every other step in the ladder of Christian experience, God says, I will supply my grace. For how do we continue walking with Christ? The book of John will tell you, as you received him, continue walking with him. In the same manner that you received him, by faith. Also continue walking with him, by faith. And my friends, it is easier to walk by faith than not by sight. We don't have time for the rest of, of that. Verse number 18. And Lot said to them, Oh no, my lords, behold, your servant has found favor in your sight. And you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot escape to the hills. And this is what the Christian does when he is escaping the city of destruction. He begins looking, they begin looking at themselves. He casts his glance away from Jesus, the man who gave him strength. And Lot moans and he says, I cannot escape to the hills. Yes, it is true, Lot, in your strength you cannot escape to the hills. But you have not been commissioned to look at, your, at yourself. You have been commissioned to look at Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 will tell you, and let us run this particular run, race looking unto Jesus. Elsewhere in that same chapter, he will say, consider the apostle of our high calling, even Jesus himself. And so when you read about the experience of the early Advent movement, the vision of Ellen, Ellen White, as she was tracing out the experience of the Advent people, she sees them walking in a particular path. And there was a particular light which was shining their pathway. And they were looking at Jesus who was at, at the end of the road. And as long as this particular pilgrim, as long as they continued looking at Jesus, they could not stumble and fall. But she records that soon some started looking away from him. And they fell backward and soon stumbled and fell. And this is what the Christian does today. This is what we do. We cannot escape to the hills we mourn. The disaster is going to overtake me and I will die. And so the enemy continues to press close to our ears. You know what? You may have fled this particular night, but tomorrow you know it is you and me again. And so the young man, the young lady looks at their weak selves and they mourn in, in utter hopelessness, as Paul would, lay, would write in the book of Romans chapter 7. That the good I want to do, that I do not. The evil that I do not want to do, that I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin and of death? The Christian mourns. But that is not to be our portion, my friends. God says that he is a very present help in time of trouble. That if ever there was a time, if ever there was a place, a circumstance, 
in which we can be certain of his sure personal presence, it is when we are in trouble. God says, I will not forsake my own. I will not abandon those with those, or, or, those whom I have purchased by the precious blood of my son, Christ Jesus. I remember the text in the Gospels. It tells me that God will not suffer even the little ones. None of my little ones will be destroyed. And so fear not, Lord. You may be a little one. You may not be able to escape to the city in your strength, but in the strength you may be in the strength of Jesus, you can escape from the city. And look at what Lord continues on to say in verse number 20. Behold, this city is near enough to flee to. And that is a danger. That is a danger that lacks in the way of the sinner who is escaping. The sinner does not want to separate himself fully from the city of Sodom. He must find ways and means and things which are not very different but similar to the indulgences that they had. And so Lord says, oh, you know, this particular place I want to flee to, it's, it's, it's a close city. It is, in other words, it is, it is separated, but not far. It is far, but not far enough. And so the devil invents unnumbered schemes to occupy our minds. Countless of them that our minds may not be able to be separated from these things that would soon have destroyed us. And that is a very strange thing that sin does. It makes death appear something to court with. It makes death appear something to romanticize about. It makes death appear beautiful. It makes, sin makes itself appear robed in uh, very beautiful robes of splendor. But that is not the case, my friends. If we are fleeing, we must flee from it completely. Not close, but far, separated. And that is why the Bible says, come ye out from them and be ye separate. In other words, you cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. In other words, there is no place for dual sim Christianity. You cannot be Airtel and Safaricom at the same time. You must choose one carrier and one carrier alone. If you tune, tune out God, you automatically tune in the devil. If you tune out the devil, you automatically tune out God. And so Elijah arranges for Israel to gather in front of the mountain and says, how long will you halt between two opinions? Perhaps he points them back to the charge of Joshua to the children of Israel. See, you know what? If it seem well for you to continue serving the gods whom your forefathers served on the other side of the Jordan, continue serving them, but as for me, he says. In other words, my friends, there cannot, there cannot be any place for, there, there, there cannot be any place for vanilla-like Christianity. Our colors must be unfurled before the world. They must know who you are and definitely so. In other words, he says, in verse number 20, let me escape there. Is it not a little one? That's another strange thing. We may not have time for it. But strange, Satan can invent even small sins. So that we reason, hey, I am not fornicating. I'm not doing, I'm not committing adultery. I am better off than so and so who is doing those particular things. Christianity is about small things. It was only a small fish and some loaves of bread that fed 5,000 people, not counting women. 
it is a small mustard seed, Jesus says, but when it is grown, it becomes a huge tree. Proverbs will tell you a little slip, a little slumber, poverty attacks you like an armed man. Christianity is but small things. It was just a little fruit. Now, 4,000 plus 6,000 years later, we find ourselves here. Sin has ravaged the entire human race. Lord continues on to mourn. It is just a little one. In other words, it is harmless. In other words, I can play with it. I can control with it. But we don't know, my friends, that as soon as we open the door for sin, sin continues on to hedge its way. As soon as it places one door on one foot on the door, my friends, you can imagine, we, find, we begin with Lot outside of Sodom, pitching towards Sodom. But now we find him in chapter 19, not only in Sodom, but Sodom in him. Be very careful that small things makes the difference. That is what Christianity is all about. A friend of mine says, small things will make you miss a very big heaven. And so he says, I want to escape to this little small city and my life will be saved. And divinity grants this particular strange request. You see, the choice is always yours to make. You must decide. God will only keep in check the angels or the hosts of darkness for opportunity once again to come to you. But make no mistake, the choice is always ultimately left to you. You are the one who decides. That particular sacred gift called choice is given to man and it is his to exercise, either for salvation or for damnation. And so he says to him, I will grant you this favor. I will not overthrow the city which you have spoken about. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. And my friends, we have been looking at the very strange deeds of wickedness in the night. For it is only at night when evil operates. The text in the book of Psalm tells me that the, it is the plague that comes at night. It is, it is, it is, it, 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 it is the plague that comes by night. It is sin that stalks in the night, and so strange deeds of sin have been happening at night. But now the sun is rising in chapter 19, verse 23. The righteousness, the righteousness of God must be revealed in the broad daylight. God does not operate in the shadows. Of course, his influence is felt there. But when he comes out to execute judgment, he comes not robed in uh, shadows of darkness. No, 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 no. He comes robed in splendor, in, in splendor in light. And so the sun continues to rise. Verse 24, the sad text. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew the cities and all the valley, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and even what grew on the ground. Everything lost. Lord, how much did you make in Sodom? The answer lies, archaeologists tell us in those particular, in the Dead Sea, they say it's the lowest point on earth. The place we are in, Nothing is alive, only a mass of water which is dead, waves which are dead lapping on the beach, nothing living there. So, Lot, how much did you gain in Sodom and Gomorrah? The Bible tells me everything here on this particular earth reserved for judgment. One day Peter speaks about it in 2 Peter chapter 3. 
after exhorting us as to what manner of persons we ought to be, says that the heavens and the earth have been res reserved for judgment. One day the elements will melt and with fervent heat. And so Lord will tell you, I didn't make anything at all. I moved near that city. Lo, I moved into the city, hoping to make a very big profit. But I lost everything. I almost lost my soul. If you had been in Sodom on that very solemn and awful evening, you never have suspected it. There was nothing outwardly to show that terrible sins were at hand even at the door. No weird omens were observed that night. No strange sounds disturbed the superstitious. No fiery sword was seen overhanging the city in tokens that the sword of the Almighty was being unsheathed. No signs appeared in the sun as it sank peacefully to rest. The, the cattle came back from the fields the sheep dogs barked, the voices of the children who at play, who at play were heard, and then darkness fell. Insects rose in the stillness of the eastern night, and the stars looked down upon that quiet scene, and the moon shone, but for the last time, on that great doomed city. Lord dwelling in us, Lord was there with his family, hurried out in the darkness to warn his relatives, but now he must flee for himself. They mock him. Lord, where are you fleeing to? Lord, you are a very superstitious man. Lord, you are an alarmist. But that strange morning, heaven begins connecting with us. But not in very good connections. These are balls of fire connecting heaven and earth. Masses of, of sulfur and brimstone are heaped upon the cities. And the smoke of the cities ascended on the very plains of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse number 26. But Lot's wife. Behind him, looked back. And she became a pillar of salt. She looked back. She looked back. The injunction, the command was, go and don't look back. In other words, give no room for those particular desires to crop again. But she looked back. You know, she, her sin will be the greater sin in our day and age. It is a sin of neglect. It is a sin of God having undertaken steps to save us. But we neglect this great salvation that has come right at our doorstep. It came right it, into the doorstep of Lot's house. And of course, Mrs. Lot's house. This particular salvation came right into the very kitchen of Lot's home. Mrs. Lot was the one who baked bread for these particular angels. This salvation came, but she neglected it. She looked back. All the steps that were taken to save her, by her choice to look back, she said, they were of no avail. And so the book of Romans tells me that God will even judge us if we hold the truth in unrighteousness. Imagine holding the truth but in unrighteousness. Holding the truth, but in unrighteousness. You know, anyway, I think that is clear. And so the temptations that were still, 
The temptations in the cities of Sodom told Lot's wife, you know, just one more look. Forgetting that my friend, one look always demands another. One glance leads to another. One cherish, well, if you continue cherishing that particular thought, it will grow another. Just one more look. Let's finish it. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of the farmers. And so it was that when God, when God destroyed the cities of the valley, this is verse 29, God remembered Abraham. And Lot went out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. And so this gives us the answer. You know, why did God spare Lot? Of course, why did God spare even his daughters? If you continue tracing out the story, you will discover, of course, Lot, we see he was not a righteous man. Any man who does that to his daughters, of course. But if you look even at the history of the, of the daughters, you trace the same, same chapter, what they did to their father, the unimaginable. And so I ask myself, why did these angels come to that particular city that day? Perhaps it is, it is this particular hope and faith of divinity. Perchance there might, there might be sinners who would be keen to entertain these particular strangers, keen to open that particular door. Perhaps if I pass by and knock, they will hear and they will ask, accept me. And so the text says, God remembered Abraham. And of course, Abraham is a type of Christ here. Abraham represents what Christ is to us. We are not saved on account of our righteousness. We are saved on account that, hey, the father remembers the son. Ultimately, that will be it. And so we must place ourselves under the shadow of the man of the Lord's favor. God remembered Abraham. God remembers his son. Therefore, he saves you. Therefore, he saves me. The text says that we are justified by him on account of his coming down from heaven, on account of his condensation, to become a man and living in temptation as a man and committing no sin and dying on that particular cross and resurrecting and beginning his high priestly ministry on account of his all those particular things, every detail that, com, that, con, 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 that constitutes the life of Christ, God remembers you and me. In other words, he looks at us only through the prism of Jesus Christ. You and I are only accepted in the beloved. That is what the text says. In the book of Colossians and in the book of Ephesians, we will read it often enough. Paul repeats it, that you and I are accepted only in the beloved. In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of our sins. By him, through him, we escape the wrath of God and are now passed into eternal life, John 5, 24. My friends, they tell me that the wages of sin is death. You know, sin tells me, or sin tells us, sin tells you just do what you want. Sin tells you don't worry about it. Sin tells you just one more look. Sin tells you there is a, a little town. Sin tells you it's just a little closer. But in the same breath and voice, righteousness, God comes to you and tells you, get up now. 
Righteousness comes and tells you, get out now. Not only get up, but get out. Sin tells you, don't wait any longer. When the soul is in peril, no earthly interest can be sufficient reason for an hour's delay. Uh, perhaps during that fateful morning in paradise, men were, and women alike were gathered in their living rooms. The smoke, smoke was beginning to cover the atmosphere. Fire was sending an alarm that, hey, you are in my path. I am coming for you. But perhaps men looked up on the years of investment they, they had made. They had put everything, their savings, everything into erecting those particular houses. But my friends, when it is time to get up, when it is time to get out, when it, is when it is time to do these two things, it is not time to wait any longer. The Lord tells you, don't stand around. Look not behind to see what will become of worldly pleasures and vanities. These are the voices that you will hear, my friend. One is from man and the other is from the world. One is from heaven and, the the one, uh, and God and one, is, and, it, and one is from the earth. One will tell you, tarry all night, be at ease, enjoy yourself while you can. The other says, escape for your life. One says, be not alarmed, make yourself comfortable where you are. The other says, haste, look not behind thee, flee to the mountain, lest you be consumed. One says, soul Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. The other says, thou fool, this night your soul may be required of thee. You see, my friends, the loving and compassionate Jesus declares that there is a greater sin than that for which Sodom and Gomorrah were overthrown. He speaks about it. He says that it will be, it will be tolerable one day for the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah more than this particular generation that he was addressing. He says, it is the sin of those who hear the gospel call to repentance and heed it not. It is the sin of those who see the son of God agonizing in the garden, dying on the cross for their salvation, but who still refuse to give him their hearts. It is the sin of those who have been many times warned, many times entreated, but who nevertheless spend their lives in waiting for a more convenient season to repent and to turn to God. It is the sin of those who put off the first great work of life and eternity finds them unprepared with all the work undone. God says it will be more tolerable for Sodom of Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for those who spend their lives in such utter neglect of the great salvation offered us. Paul mourns and he says, how shall we escape if we neglect this particular great salvation? Yes, this Jesus, the compassionate one, gives a very solemn warning to the neglecters and the despisers of his day of grace, that his voice may echo and resound throughout, throughout all time that everyone who might hear might be saved and not do. His most awful threatening voice also invites or also involves an invitation of equal extent. He awakens fear that he may be able to kindle hope. He commands effort that he may save from despair. He draws back the veil from the pit of darkness that we may be constrained to look up when he unfolds the glories of paradise. Wait not for better opportunities to begin a better life. Any opportunity to secure infinite and eternal blessing is a good one. And therefore, take it and grab it. Run away with it. The solemn monitions of conscience. What your soul tells you, what you yourself what you tell yourself, and of course the uncertain tenure of all earthly possessions, the embittered and transitory nature of all earthly joys, the admonitions of divine providence in affliction and death, the sweet and mystery constraint of the love of Christ and all the perils and sorrows and the necessities of the soul, all of them 
continually say to the hesitating and to the halting, haste and escape for your life. Make sure that your flight to the stronghold of hope is before the voice of mercy ceases to call. Before the angel of grace takes her flight, never more to return again. Before the heavens are cold in, 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 in darkness. Before the high priest throws down that particular censer. As he now shuffles his feet in the most holy place, making his final atonement on the behalf of the fallen sons of men, he invites us. As grace swings open, as that particular door swings open, hinged on grace, he says this. You know, this is the testimony of the man who knew all history. Even Jesus himself, he says, in this particular last days, they will eat, they will drink, they will buy, they will send, they will plant, and they will build. In other words, the whole of their thoughts and their, whole, their efforts and their desires will be given to a life of senses, denying God and debasing the soul. And so they will become so passionate and so haughty in their devotion to earthly possessions and sensual pleasures, pleasures as to count it a mockery for one to say to them that are in danger. There is guilt in such a life. We finish with the text in Jude chapter 1 verse 7. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities which were likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued a natural desire, served as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. How are you journeying in this particular pilgrim pathway? The text says that we are not we are strangers and pilgrims in this in this particular world, and that was the lot of Abraham. That was the lot of all the children of faith. Lot began that particular way, started with pitching tents, but no sooner had he pitched towards Sodom than he found himself seated at the very gates of Sodom, neglecting this particular pilgrim-like mentality. My friends, the good of this particular world reminds us that there is something better. God says, you know, you picture Abraham looking down towards Sodom, the man who chose a better lot, the one who allowed Jesus to choose for him where he should live, who should be around him, how he should conduct his life, how he should conduct his family. Look at him standing on the hills, looking at the very plains of Sodom. He escaped. Nay, he was far away from that particular city of destruction. The text says he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Let us not be satisfied with this particular world. Let us be satisfied only as we are safely anchored in Christ Jesus. O oh soul, why, why will you linger? O oh soul, why will you linger? What would you give in exchange for your soul? The song asks. There is a man far away from the Savior today. Living his her life in particular ways in which you know, and it is definite that Christ has been speaking to you. Evidence upon evidence of him inviting you and even more evidence of you rejecting him. The tragedy of the world is this, my friends, that indeed men will be lost, but they will not be lost not because they didn't know, but men will be lost because they simply neglected. That word, neglect. In other words, you do not doubt but you presume and say it doesn't matter. Neglect. Men will be lost because of that. The text in John chapter 3, I believe is verse 19, will say that this is the condemnation. That Christ came into the world 
but men loved darkness rather than light. In the book of 2 Corinthians, it will tell you, and we know it is certain in these particular last days, that Antichrist, of course, will perform his marvelous works. Great will be the signs and wonders that are going to follow soon after as we trace out the details of this earth's history. But as strange as it sounds, the text in Thessalonians says that for this cause, for this particular cause of rejecting light, God will give them, will give men up to their strong delusions that they would rather believe a lie because they, they received not the love of the truth. Friends, we must allow Jesus to plant this particular love of truth in our hearts. As he plants this particular enmity against sin, let us invite him to plant this particular truth in our hearts. Let us allow him to affect us in such a way that we would rejoice with the psalmist as he says, as he considers the work that, they are, they are, that his words are more precious than gold, yeah, more fine than silver, more, 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 more to be desired are they than gold. Let us allow him to plant in us this particular love for truth. And who is truth? John 14 verse 6 will tell you, I am the way, Jesus, that is. I am the truth. Eventually, even the very end of your day, I am the life. May God grant us to be affected when angels visit us in mass. The book of Hebrews says, be careful to entertain strangers. For some, long before, entertained angels unaware. Messages sent you away. Of course, angels are representations of, or representatives of messages that come your way. More than any other time in history, in this particular COVID period, opportunities for us to accept Jesus have never become more. You just have to tune to Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, and you will find there angels inviting us out to accept Christ in mass. They tell me that one day, you know, when we are arraigned before the bar of God, you know, the solemn truth will be made manifest that light adjusts how God deals with us, that privileges will tell us or will inform how God deals with us. And so neglected opportunities, neglected privileges, slighted masses, invitations and reproofs sent our way, but we have refused. All of them will be recollected into the memory. And one final time, as every knee bows and every tongue confesses that he, Jesus Christ, is Lord, Men will thunder out from the very length and breadth of the earth that indeed true and just are your ways, O King of kings. My friends, Jesus has provided a way. He has won that victory. Won't we be part of that victory? Shall we pray? Our gracious Father in heaven, we want to thank you. We want to Thank you because of the word sent our way, not only today, but every day in our lives, inviting us out to choose the better portion, to look to you not simply by sight, but by faith, to catch a glimpse of this salvation purchased for us at so great a cost. Lord, we pray that you will awaken in our hearts the very desire, the very fact that we have a heaven to win and a hell to shun. I pray, Lord, that you will disturb us in our own comfort zones, that in a special sense, you will awaken in us desires in the pursuit of truth and holiness, in the pursuit of Christ. We recognize our sinfulness and we confess. We recognize our weakness. We recognize our unrighteousness. 
and we pray that we will be granted favor on account of Christ Jesus. Please forgive. Respond to those hearts that are crying out to you right now for salvation. And fetter us, perhaps stupefied by the world and its desires and its lusts thereof. I pray, Lord, that your voice will break that particular spell binding us. I pray, Lord, that we will hear you calling us out that come unto me. Lord, I pray that you will grant us indeed to come to you. Bless your children in this particular space and all those listening and all those who will hear. Grant that we will be saved for eternity. It is our sincere prayer in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for such a powerful sharing. I'll give a chance to Elder Mogesi uh, maybe to, to say something before we break for lunch. God is good. I want to thank you for, for enabling us, uh, you know, have you here and uh, for tuning in. I want to appreciate as well that God has been faithful to you in wherever you are. Every minute you have to pray, to worship, just make sure that just like the speaker has spoken to us, make sure you are ready. Make sure you use this opportunity to... <clears throat> prepare and keep your lamp burning. I want to pray that you also not forget to come back at two. We are having another program. And every day, I hope God will always give you strength and courage to share our links to have more friends joining. God bless you so much. May God keep you going. And as a church, we shall make sure that our programs are well, uh, you know, presented and uh, they are you know, brought in time. So make sure you come on board every day. God bless you so much. May God lead you. I'm glad that you are worshiping. Thank you so much. Back to you, Elder Shem. Amen. And uh, I pray that uh, let this message transform us and uh, let's have the love of truth. And uh, I'll request uh, Brother Dan, to please offer us the last word of prayer so that we meet in the afternoon at uh, 3, 3, 2 p.m. We pray. Our Father in heaven, I pray that you will express us all as your children with your blessings. And uh, may your grace be abundant May it be abundant over us. May your face shine upon us. And may you grant us peace. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we shall be able to meet, uh, I hope, in the afternoon. Let us keep vigil in prayer and God will always strengthen us. Thank you so much.